here are the answers to the review for exam 3. I've just selected a few questions. But do remember that you have to study from the quizzes, the problem sets, and mastering physics in addition to this review. Okay, question number one talks about a long horizontal wire carrying 22 amperes of current due north. What is the net magnetic field 20 centimeters due west of the wire if the Earth's field there points north but downward 37 degrees below the horizontal and has a magnitude 5 times 10 to the negative 5 Tesla? Now, here there are two, uh, two magnetic fields. One is the magnetic field due to the Earth and the other is the magnetic field due to the current flowing through the conductor. And we got to find the resultant of the two magnetic fields. Sketch it down. You get that's the x-axis and that is the Earth's magnetic field 37 degrees below the horizontal and it is 5 times 10 to the negative 5 Tesla. And uh, BW is the magnetic field due to the to the due to the wire due to the current in the wire and it's given by the formula v naught i by 2 pi r where r is the distance uh, v naught is 4 pi times 10 to the negative 7 the current flowing is 22 amperes and you have 2 pi times 20 centimeters converted into meter that gives 2.2 .2 times 10 to the negative 5 Tesla. Now this has to be, you know, the, the Earth's magnetic field has to be resolved into two components, Bx and By. Bx is the cos component and By is the sine component. And then after we get these components, we see that there are two magnetic fields along the y-axis. One is this, Bw, the other is By. So take the resultant of the two. Uh, and then along the x, you only have this. So you can see that I've already taken the resultant along the By, along the y-axis, one minus the other. And once you get that, you find the resultant by using the Pythagorean theorem, sum of the squares and take the square root, which gives 4.1 times 10 to the negative 5 Tesla. That takes us to the second question. The generator of a car idling at 1100 RPM produces 12.4 volt. What will be the output at a rotation speed of 2500 RPM, assuming nothing else changes? In an AC generator, we know that the EMF produced or the voltage produced depends on the number of turns, the strength of the magnetic field, the area of the coil, and the speed of rotation. But in this case, nothing else changes. It's only the angular speed that changes. So we can take this as a ratio. We know that EMF depends on, as I said, the number of turns, the magnetic field strength area, and the angular speed. The only omega changes. Therefore, we can take this as a ratio. And we can say E1 by E2 is equal to omega 1 by omega 2. Plug in the values and find E2. We did not even change it into RPS or anything, it's just a ratio. So you get 28.18 volts. But do remember that this formula is very important. That is the peak voltage produced by a generator. Brings us to the third question. The back EMF in a motor is 95 volt when the motor is operating at 1000 rpm how would you change the motor's magnetic field if you want to reduce the back emf to 65 volt when the motor was running at 2500 rpm 
Back EMF is nothing but the induced EMF. And again, the induced EMF, the peak value is given by NBA omega, which means, as in this case, you can see that there are two quantities that change, the strength of the magnetic field and the angular speed. So once again, taking it as a ratio, because N and A are constants. Taking it as a ratio, this is what we get. And you're asked to find B2. And omega is 2 pi times F. The 2 pi's get cancelled and make B2 the subject. That is B2 by B1. We're going to get the ratio. And so we can say that B2 is 27.37% of B1. That is how you can reduce the back EMF to 65 volt when the motor was running at 2500 RPM. Number four, if 30 megawatts of power at 45 kilovolt arrives at a town from a generator via four ohm transmission lines, calculate the EMF at the generator end of the lines and the fraction of the power generated that is wasted in the lines. Remember that a transformer is chiefly used to reduce the power wasted during transmission. And how is this done? This is done by transmitting AC at a very high voltage so that the current is really small. Why? Because heat produced in a transmission line is proportional to the square of the current. So when we keep the current low, the heat generated is really low. Now, in this question, first let's find the current. Current is power by voltage. Power is 30 megawatts. That's why you have the 10 to the 6 and 45 kilowatts, so 10 to the 3. Get the current as 666.7 ampere. And the EMF is going to be the output voltage plus I times R. The output voltage is 45 kilovolt and I times R because R of 4 ohms is the resistance of the transmission lines. So we get 47.67 kilovolt was actually generated but what reached the town was only 45 kilowatt. And the second part says, what is the fraction of the power generated that is wasted? Power loss is uh, given by I squared times R. So since you're asked to find the fraction, you're going to take the fraction of the power lost. Okay, I hope that makes sense because it's I squared R that is lost divided by the total because we're getting 30 megawatts plus whatever was lost. That's what is going to give us the fraction. And on carefully calculating, we get that as 0 0.0559, which is approximately 5.6% of the power was wasted even though the voltage of transmission was 45 kilovolt. Number five, calculate the reactance of an RMS current in a 160 millihenry radio coil connected to a 240 volt 10 kilohertz AC line. Inductive reactance XL is given by 2 pi F times the inductance. All quantities given directly here 
uh, inductances in milli henry which would be 60 160 times 10 to the negative 3 to change it into henry's gives 1004.8 ohms and to find the current we know IRMS is VRMS by XL VRMS is given as 240 volt and divided by XL and therefore the IRMS is 0 0.238 ampere oh that was a calculation mistake so it's 1000 10,053 actually, I'm sorry for that, 10,053, so I've changed it now, it's 0 0.024 ampere. Brings us to number 6, what are the total impedance, phase angle and RMS current in an LRC circuit. Okay, so you have all the three components here, it's better to calculate the individual reactances first, XL is 2 pi f times uh, the inductance that is 1382 ohms and xc is 1 by 2 pi fc Capacitance is 6250 picofarads, so times 10 to the negative 12, which gives 2546 ohms. And impedance in an LCR circuit is square root R squared plus XL minus XC whole squared. So plug the numbers in, it's 8.7 kilo ohms, that's why it's 10 to the 3. That gives 87.78 ohms and the tan of phi, which is the phase angle, phi is the phase angle, is given by this formula. It's 1382 minus 2546 by 8700, which gives negative 0 0.1338. That means the, the current is lagging the EMF. And IRMS is, of course, VRMS by impedance. The RMS 725 and we got the impedance so dividing that gives the RMS value of current 0 0.082 ampere brings us to number 7 the magnetic field in a traveling electromagnetic wave has an RMS strength 28.5 nano tesla how long does it take to deliver 235 joules of energy uh, Okay, the energy traveling per unit area per second is called the Ponting Vector. That is energy per unit area per time. It's represented by S. And it's given by CB squared by mu naught. Because we take the RMS value. So that can be rearranged to make time the subject. And then mu naught is 4 pi times 10 to the negative 7. Delta U is the energy, that's 235, and area is in centimeter squared, got to change it into meter squared. It's times 10 to the negative 4. C is the speed of electromagnetic waves, 3 times 10 to the 8, and 28.5 nano tesla, that's 10 to the negative 9 tesla, is the RMS value of magnetic field. When all that is plugged in, calculated, you get that much in seconds, converted into days, you get approximately 140 days. Number eight, how much energy is transported across a one centimeter squared area per hour 
by an electromagnetic wave whose electric field has an armature strength of 38.6 okay again this is to do with pointing vector s is equal to delta u by a delta t and that is also given by the formula c epsilon not e squared rms see so in the last question uh, we had the pointing vector in terms of the magnetic field and in this problem we have the pointing vector in terms of the electric field and these are two important formulas to remember so when you rearrange this to make delta u by delta t the subject substitute the numbers epsilon not as the permittivity of free space which is 8.85 times 10 to the negative 12 and uh, the point 0386 is because it was given in millivolt 3600 is to calculate uh, it in seconds because one hour is 3600 seconds and plugging all that gives 1.42 times 10 to the negative 6 joule per hour brings us to the next one a luminous object 3 millimeter high now this is optics it's placed 20 centimeter from a convex mirror now we really need to know that the focal length of a convex mirror is negative and it is half the radius so f here we get it as 10 do remember it's negative 10 because it's virtual DO is 20. That's the object distance. And we got to find DI. The mirror equation and the lens equation are the same. 1 by DO plus 1 by DI is equal to 1 by F. Rearrange that. And that gives di is equal to negative 6.67 centimeter. And then to find the magnification, magnification is hi by ho, also given by minus di by do. So make hi the subject, get this equation, and on plugging in the numbers, get the height of the image as one millimeter remember that uh, you will be asked to draw diagrams uh, basically four diagrams concave uh, mirror producing real or virtual image convex producing virtual image and then when it comes to lenses you have the same combination backwards convex lens produces real and virtual and a concave lens only produces virtual. So that's about six diagrams which you could be asked to draw. Now that diagram is too small, so let me just, okay. Here, uh, I'm just drawing the diagram again. That's a convex mirror, parallel ray, appears to come through the focus and a ray through the the middle of the mirror is reflected and so you see OA is the object, IB is the image. Now that is what we got a 6.67 centimeters. The object was 20 centimeters away. The object was 20 centimeters away. The focal length was 10 centimeters we got the image 6.67 centimeters away that is perfect okay the next one is again this is about generally a spherical mirror it doesn't say which one but we can find so it says it's desired to produce a virtual image that is upright and smaller did you notice that the object is 4.5 centimeters tall while the image is only 3.5 centimeters so definitely this is a convex mirror because it's only a convex mirror that produces a smaller virtual image and then to find 
where the image is located, which means you have to find DI. DO is 28 and uh, because it's a convex mirror, again, the focal length is negative. It is a convex mirror because uh, the virtual image is smaller than the object. Magnification is negative di by do. which is also equal to HI by HO. Both HI and HO are given. Now rearrange that simply to find DI as negative 21.778. And now the focal length can be found using the lens equation. One by 28 plus, but uh, remember D is negative, so negative 21.78. So rearrange, calculate, you get F is negative nine, 98 centimeters. Okay, light is incident on an equilateral glass prism at a 45 degrees angle. Calculate the angle at which light emerges from the opposite face, that means you have to find theta 4. Remember the diagram of the prism where light falls on one face, comes out through the other. Incident ray bends one time, bends a second time. And you see that is I1. Mm, I've labeled it differently now. I've called it R1, R2. Okay. In any case, I1 is 45 degrees. I2 is what we have to find. Uh, the two materials uh, have refractive indices N1 and N2. Apply Snell's law at the first phase. You get N1 sine I1 is N2 sine R, R1. I should have written sine R1 there. Mm -hmm. Anyways, that angle there, which is supposed to be R1, is 26.6 degrees. But we also know that R1 plus R2 is A. Okay, now I'm changing it. It's R1. So we can find R2. Sixty minus 26.6. And then we can apply Snell's law again at phase 2, which would make it N1 sine R2. Okay, actually is N1 sine I2 is N2 sine R2, correct? So that will be 1 sine I2 is 1.58 sine 33.4. And now we can find I2. Get it as 60.5 degrees. This brings us to the lens question. Uh, remember that uh, the power of a lens is the reciprocal of its focal length, but the focal length has to be in meters. Power is measured in diopters. And in this question, you can see the power is negative 5.5. That means it's a concave lens. Okay, so power is 1 by focal length, but focal length has to be in meters. So when you rearrange that, and you can find the focal length. Since the power is in diopters, you're going to get the focal length in meters, which is minus 18.2 centimeters. So it's a concave lens. Object distance is 14 centimeters. Use the lens equation to find di.
on calculation you get di is negative 7.91 centimeter so the negative shows that it's a virtual image and then use the formula for the two formulas for magnification and find hi Okay, this question is about a plano concave lens. That means one side is plane, the other side is concave. And we have to use the lens maker's equation to find the radius. The lens maker's equation, that is how the plano concave lens looks. That is, the plane surface has a radius infinity. And R2, we do not know. And this is the lens maker's equation. 1 by f is n minus 1 times 1 by r1 plus 1 by r2. Hmm. I guess it doesn't really matter, but it's, it's a plus there. Okay. So you get 1 by r2 there. You know, a planar convex lens has a negative focal length. So that's why, but this can be taken as positive again. Therefore, R2 is going to be negative 11.7 centimeters. In fact, this is also negative. Uh, this is again uh, to do with a prism, but it's essentially the same problem as before. The only difference here is that there are two colors and the index of refraction is slightly different. So just like we did the previous problem, find the, the angle of emergence for both of them separately and then find the difference. So first I'm finding it out for lambda 1. That's application of Snell's law at phase 1. That gives us theta 2. That's 35.76 degrees. And then for lambda 2, Now since this is not a prism, it's just a piece of glass, you need not go through all the hassle of applying the equation, you know, three equations. Just do it directly in this case because it's a, it's a piece of glass. So it's just a matter of applying Snell's law. You get us 35.98 degrees. Take the difference between them. And we get it as 0 0.2154. Well, I had to put this review, put it together in a short time. Now, once again, remember that just doing the review is not going to be enough for the exam. You've got to go through the problem sets, the quiz answers, and uh, then take a look at the review. And also do remember that there will be at least two uh, figures that you have to draw on the exam so thank you and good luck if you have any questions always write to me or text me